This is Ishrit Fatima. I'm the chief program chair for this program. Why the Toastmasters Revelation program? Nelson Mandela had said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. The same logic applies to Toastmasters. Education acts as a catalyst to elevate Toastmasters to additional levels of performance by crystallizing the core of the integrity, respect, service, and excellence. The communication and leadership skills you will gain and hone within Toastmaster form an invaluable foundation in preparing you for the world beyond Toastmasters. We have launched this program called the Toastmasters Revelation to invite renowned Toastmasters in the Bay Area and around the world to present educational sessions every Saturday, starting from 2 p.m. till 3 p.m. to provide a bridge to our Toastmaster to apply their skills in the real world. The vision of this program, to learn from the best in Toastmasters on how to improve our communication and leadership skills. Each session highlights the most transformational moments experienced by illustrious Toastmasters, distinguished public speakers, contest winners, distinguished Toastmasters, leaders, and experts. Today's agenda will be divided into three sessions, three segments. The story, the invited speaker shares the story and highlights the transformational moments that had rendered him to be the Toastmaster. Second part will be mechanics. The presenter dives into the mechanics that created those transformational moments. Our third segment will be question answer session. We request you to give us the questions and we request our speaker to answer them. Without any further delay, let me welcome our Toastmaster of the day, Izumi Yamamoto. She is Area Divan Director. Let us welcome Izumi. Thank you, Ishraf. I'm the Toastmaster of this session. Before we start with our amazing guest, John, please mute yourself. But please turn on your video so John can see your reactions. <laughs> also, as you just mentioned, there will be 15 minutes Q&A at the end. That means please feel free to type in your question in the chat as we move along. I will take them at the end. With that, I would like to introduce John Godoy, an award-winning inventor, a founder of a renowned coaching company, and an authority on how professionals can create a powerful communication habit. Over to you, John. Thank you, Toastmaster Izumi. Whether you're speaking to an audience of one or a hundred, I believe the approach is exactly the same. Whether it's face-to-face uh, -face on a Zoom call, whether it's at a trade show, whether it's creating social media content, whether it's going to a job interview, it's exactly the same. Be yourself. Speak in a conversational tone and then apply skills and strategies specifically from the fields of public speaking, the performance arts and social psychology to amplify your message. I'll be very honest with you. I didn't know this when I first graduated from school. Like most people, I didn't have any type of training, but there was a huge expectation on my shoulders, just like everyone else, that once you enter into the professional world that you become or you are a good communicator. But as we all know, there's a big difference being able to, to being able to talk well versus to communicate effectively. My journey uh, in becoming a, an effective communicator started 15 years ago. And I'll be very straightforward with you. I am an introvert, quite shy. I hated networking. I hated getting out in front of people. And I avoided it. I never wanted to do it. But when I started my first company, the irony is that one of the things that we did is we did seminars and workshops for executives because it was a corporate wellness company and during these seminars we taught executives how to be more productive and more effective my business partner was really good at communicating and giving presentations so he did them all the time 
But there was this one opportunity that I remember, this one occasion where he couldn't do it. And I had to do it. I remember very distinctly, I got up in front of a room full of 40 business executives. And for 60 minutes, I wasted their time. I wasted their time because I just used my intellect and my words and what I knew to try to get my message across. And as we know, that doesn't necessarily work. And so for 60 minutes, I wasted their time and I looked at their faces at the end of it. And this is what I saw. They knew that I had wasted their time. They knew that I hadn't the skills to deliver the message well. And this feeling that overcame me of, of just being embarrassed was awful. And so I decided to do something about it. And this led me to a group called Extreme Toastmasters here in Chicago. And I joined Extreme Toastmasters and there I learned some fundamental skills on how to communicate a little bit better, how to overcome some of my nervousness and my anxiety. And it was during that time that I learned to present a little bit better. However, during that time, I also realized that I was missing a crucial component of effective communication. And that was to use my facial expressions and my body language to help amplify my message. Because one of the challenges of a lot of people in North America, and particularly a lot of men, is to express, to learn how to express your body. We tend to just try to use our words and very little facial expression. So I actually needed to get some training for that. And that led me to Second City Improv, which is an improvisation group in the city of Chicago. And there I learned how to be, to let loose a little bit more and how to use this to get my message across. But I was still missing another component of it. And that was how to craft compelling messages, compelling speeches that people would actually listen to. Because yeah, there's one, there's, there's one side of it as where you can create a, an okay speech, an okay presentation and get by, but there's strategies and skills to create powerful presentations that people will want to listen to. And so I started working with a Hall of Fame speaker by the name of Mickey Williams, and she taught me a lot of the skills to craft presentations that stick in people's mind. So at this point, I was able to give good seminars and good workshops. However, it was after my next business. It was a business where we invented, my partners and I invented a fitness project product in a garage, brought it to market, crowdfunded it, manufactured it overseas, and now we sell it. And it was during that process I realized just how powerful learning how to communicate is, how to give effective presentation. It's, it's not just about giving presentations. It's about giving investor pitches. It's about interviewing candidates to work at your company. It's about creating social media content for YouTube and, and Instagram. All these situations where you become the primary face of your brand. And well, here's another funny thing. I, our company made it to the fourth round of interviews with, on Shark Tank. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the fourth round of interviews of Shark Tank is the last round of interviews where you go to before getting selected to be on the show. And for that round of interviews, they expect you to create a founder's video where the founders talk to the sharks directly and try to communicate a compelling message to get them to say, wow, this person's interesting for television. This person's interesting. Their product is interesting. Let's bring them on. So that's just showing you all the different places where these skills are extremely valuable. And so today I'm going to share with you as much of those skills that I've learned along the way. And I call it speaking wisdom. It's that intersection between what you learn, I guess, in the books, in the programs, and what you learn through trial and error out in the field, speaking and looking at people's reactions. And it's that which I hope to share with you in Revelations today. And there's four areas that it generally covers. One is delivery, one is structure, one is anxiety, and one is technical skills. For today's purposes, I'm going to cover the, the following four things in the following order. First one we're going to cover is virtual communication, how to come across powerfully on Zoom and on video. The second is we're going to cover anxiety and nervousness, because if you don't get over that, it doesn't matter <laughs> how well you're set up for Zoom and virtual communication, you're not going to come across well. Third, it's going to be about developing executive presence. Executive presence meaning how to come across and command the screen or command the stage without actually uttering a word. And a lot of that has to do with body language. And then the fourth is if we have time, it's going to be covering what I call a message map. It's a seven step process through which you can craft a message. But in order so that you have something that you can sink your teeth into and apply right away, I've decided that the order that I shared with you is what we're going to do today. To that end, I'm going to share with you a presentation 
So a little bit about my, my background, because this is going to put into perspective what I'm sharing with you today. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an inventor. I brought a product to market, as I described. I'm also a fitness trainer. And the reason why I share that with you is a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you is essentially body hacks on how to use sleep, exercise, nutrition to help overcome anxiety and actually come across more powerfully. That's where the health and fitness side comes from. It. And then I'm a speaking coach, and I also uh, speak uh, internationally to groups and organizations. I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years. I'm a communications instructor at the University of Alberta, spoken at domestic and international universities, executive management teams. And I also had a, the good fortune to be a consultant for a candidate for the United States Senate. He did not win, so you wouldn't know him, and you may disagree with his politics. We're gonna skip over who that is, but I had that opportunity. What I believe, and this is the, probably the most important thing, is I, I believe when you go to Toastmasters, when you learn communication, you're not learning how to give a good speech. What you're learning is how to become a good communicator in any setting. So you don't actually have to transform into something that you're not when you speak and present. There's a term called speaker man and you, or speaker woman. And it's, it's the term that you give to someone when they get up on stage and automatically they transform into something you've never seen before. They look like they're gonna sell you something from television or a car or something along those lines. And it's the transformation oftentimes is very disingenuous and it doesn't come across well. A modern communicator speaks in a conversational tone and is just themselves. And therefore I truly believe that what I'm gonna share with you today is, is material and ways of thinking that you apply to your day-to-day -day life. So that when you do get up and you present, whether it's an interview, whether it's a speech, whether it's a business meeting, you don't have to change. You, it's just an easy switch to the different situation and then perhaps apply a few extra skills here and there to amplify your message. So then the next question is, where do you use public speaking skills? Well, in a face-to-face -face type set, setting, as I mentioned, there's sales pitches, you can teach, you can give large speeches, you can give marketing, free marketing presentations. That's what gets your product out there. You can do job interviews, networking, uh, dating. I was giving a presentation in Japan and a gentleman asked me, oh, that was a great presentation. Can you teach me how to talk to women? Hadn't ever thought about that, but that becomes a very powerful uh, idea because for some people, communication means something completely different. So that's the face-to-face -face world. This is the virtual world. You have traditional Zoom calls. You have live streaming, ask me anything, video streaming services. I would challenge you to consider using, creating video resumes. If you're ever looking for a work, it's a job, it's a way to stand out. And I would challenge you to be the protagonist in that video by showing up in it and, and being compelling and speaking. Then there's social media and branding, making your own social media content. This is how you create an online presence. There's a lot of material out there on things like LinkedIn, and, and twi well, uh, let's just talk about LinkedIn, which is a pr the primary kind of job work site where people just put articles and a lot of text and it's just getting flooded with that kind of material or they're repurposing other people's material. I would challenge you to be a thought leader and create your own content using video. And that's why I said the fourth skill to learn is the technical side of it, where whether it's like using effective editing content or learning SEO and all that material. The next place is because of the fact that we're on a, the whole world is essentially doing global communication. Your whole world is essentially your audience, your potential customer, your client. Consider that's why you need to get good at these skills. And then lastly, video prospecting. I can't tell you how many times I've secured a, a, an interview, a, a, a potential discussion with a potential client based on a video resume. Now, if you send a traditional document, okay, they may look at it, but it really doesn't stand out. But if you make a personalized video and you are the communicator on it, it becomes a very powerful way to stand out and show them a lot more of, of who you are rather than just a sta static uh, traditional resume. So we're gonna start off very simply, very straightforward virtual communication. There's four things you need to remember. What you see here is what, what is actually you see. This is. What you see is me right now. <laughs> this is where I'm talking and communicating from you from. Nothing fancy. I have a ring light. I'm standing. I'm wearing specific type of clothing. I've specifically got a white black wall 
and I'm looking into the lens of the camera. You do these five things, you will come across much more powerfully any type of communication situation you're gonna be in. Whether it's a Zoom call, it's a meeting, anything to that effect. You know, I've, I've, been, I've been giving virtual presentations all over the place and 99% of the people are sitting because for whatever reason they think you're supposed to. I would challenge you to think, no, forget it. I'm gonna stand because the benefit of standing is this. <laughs> I can move a lot more, I can convey my message more, I can come across more powerfully. Now, if that makes you feel a little insecure uh, about doing that, then during the regular part of your meeting, sit. But then when you do your presentation, you stand up and then you can use the full force of all the tools that you have at your disposal to get your message across. And the second thing is about lighting. Because on Zoom, so much of your message is gonna be from here up if you're not standing. It's basically this. So if your face is not well lit, it's gonna be hard for people to tell what's going on with your message. They're not gonna be able to fully understand the words that you're saying because not everybody is an auditory listener. A lot of people are looking at your facial expressions and a little bit of your gestures to kind of fill in the gaps that they may not hear. That's just, that's just another benefit of having light. Clothing is very important. Often, I was, <laughs> I was on a call not too long ago with this young gentleman, extremely, extremely brilliant aerospace engineer. And he wanted some help preparing for some job interviews. And we had our first call and the moment the camera turned on, I got angry. I was angry and I was appalled and I said, oh my goodness, Generation Z, oh. And I made all these terrible assertions in my head. But the, the gentleman had not been properly trained in how to come across well, even on a, a regular phone call. He was wearing kind of like a sweatsuit. The camera angle was looking at his wall, his dirty room, and he just wasn't taking it as seriously as possible. But within you know, five to 10 seconds, essentially, you're gonna make that first impression on Zoom. The moment that Zoom camera lens comes on, it's showtime. And if you're not dressed powerfully, well, you've lost it. Let me quantify that. Well, I don't know if quantify the right word is give that a little bit more meat to it. And why, why clothing is so powerful rather than just superficial side of it. There's this gentleman by the name of Joe Navarro. And Joe Navarro is an author, he's an FBI agent, former FBI agent, and he talks a lot about body language and the power of body language. And one particular thing he talks about is clothing. And well, we all generally know how clothing affects other people, right? You make a judgment based on how you, other people make a judgment upon you based on what you're wearing. They create associations with what groups you may belong to, what you, you know, whether, what social class you're into, what music or all that, that's what they, that's what they think. But Joe Navarro also suggests that what you're wearing also affects your own sense of self, how you carry yourself, and ultimately then how you project yourself. And he gives this example of this study they did at FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia. And what they did is they created a hostage situation. And the situation was there was this little girl and she was held hostage. And they took two groups of FBI agents. Uh, one group, they dressed up in business attire, in traditional suit, tie, dress pants. And then the other group, they dressed up in SWAT gear, like military outfit, essentially. And both groups had the exact same challenge, come up with a plan to rescue this little girl. The ones in the business suits, well, they opened up a line of communication and started to negotiate. Makes sense. But the group dressed up in, in SWAT gear, in military fatigue, military outfit, their plan was to go in, kick the door down, rescue the girl. But the only difference was that their type of, their clothing was different. And there's a reason why police officers, soldiers, they stand a little taller, look a little bit different, carry themselves a little bit different when they put on their uniform. Or when a bride puts on their dress, or a woman puts on their most amazing outfit, they feel sexy, they feel good, and that carries itself in your message. And so even on Zoom calls, even if it doesn't seem like it's that important, I would challenge you to wear clothes that make you wear, wear, feel powerful from the shoes all the way up. Don't leave the shoes to ch the chance. Put something on your feet. Next thing is a background. Uh, and something I also wanna share with is, is this. Everything that you see, uh, how can I say it? Everything that, well, I'll just say it again. Everything that you see is something that I've learned from somebody. 
Yeah, it's not like I knew all this stuff. And, it's, and that's how I hope you approach this webinar, as not everything's gonna be for you, this is just my perspective of the things that work, but take things that work for you and apply them, like this. I learned this from a gentleman in India during an Ask Me Anything, preparations for an Ask Me Anything live streaming event. And back before I had a Zoom screen, and he said that as I was moving, it became, the, the Zoom screen just kind of, it, my hand got distorted in the Zoom. So he said, it's very simple, just keep it clear in the background so you become center of attention. Take a step back to clothing. I learned from a group in Brazil. I had, I had a um, striped shirt, you know, the ones with the, it's basically lines going down, lines going across. I forget what the name of that is, but I had one of those types of shirts. And they said, don't wear that because over there, if the person doesn't have good connectivity and you're wearing a striped shirt like that, it becomes, it's like visually makes you kind of feel sick. I didn't know that. So that's why I'm wearing a solid color and it's not, there's no lines to it. Solid dark color with a clear contrast. That's why I, I'm wearing this type of clothing. And then the last thing I'm gonna share with you is lens. Look into the lens of the camera when you speak. It is the new eye contact, right? For Toastmasters, for a lot of communicators, eye contact is the hardest thing to master, to get used to. But this, this is the most powerful. Imagine if I'm giving you this web presentation, I'm looking down like this, right? If I, if I said I was looking to you, talking to you from this angle, this has been overdone. This is too much of an exaggeration. No one really gives a webinar like this, but they will do it like this because they're looking at their screen and their, their lens is right above it. I challenge you to just always be looking at your lens and really practice using your peripheral vision to look at everything around it. Okay, always look at your lens, and then if you need to get visual feedback from everybody else, uh, then just, again, use your peripheral vision. Because there's nothing more distracting uh, when you're presenting in front of a group than a Zoom screen. Because people forget they're on the screen, and they're getting up, and they're going, and they're moving around, and that can throw you off. In webinars, they also have a counter in the bottom left-hand corner of people entering and exiting the room. That can throw you off because if the number goes down for whatever reason, they could have a, a glitch. They may not be interested. That plays a psychological trick on you, right? So you end up focusing on that number. Why are people leaving? You start becoming self-conscious. It becomes difficult to get the message across. So again, look at the lens and you'll be successful. Well, it'll be much more effective. All right. We're going to go now to anxiety and nervousness. Anxiety and nervousness. I don't need to read stuff in the orange little box there. <laughs> this is just to illustrate. Uh, this is going to be the second part of, of how to deal with anxiety, and that's practice. We're going to start with the first part, which is inoculation. So usually when you think about the term inoculation, you're thinking about, you know, some sort of, what's the word for it? It's shot. what we're all waiting for, the shot, <laughs> right? So that we get, can go back to the way it normalized. You're looking for that inoculation so that you don't get the disease. Well, human beings are one of the few creatures in the world that you can just imagine a stressful event, right? You imagine people judging you. You imagine failing uh, your presentation. You can just think that, and then all of a sudden in your body, the stress response kicks in, and all of a sudden the, the hormone cortisol and adrenaline starts pumping through your body, and all of a sudden you, your hands start shaking, your voice starts to go, you start sweating. That's when nervousness kicks in. You know, although it's an imagined threat, your body's stress response reacts exactly the same as if someone was charging at you literally with a knife. So let's say this happens. You're about to give a presentation. You're imagining failing. The stress response kicks in. You manage somehow. A miracle, you get through it. What's the first thing you do afterwards? You shake your body, you go for a run, you just kind of shake it out. Because you shake it out, you move because your body's trying to relax itself, right? It's trying to flush that cortisol and the adrenaline out of your body. What the point I'm trying to make is that does you no good. Movement does you no good after the stressful event because you already have to give the presentation. So when I say inoculate, I mean before your speech, before your presentation, inoculate yourself using movement, using exercise, physical activity, because what that's gonna do is gonna relax your body. It's gonna get rid of that cortisol. It's gonna help flush some of that cortisol out. It's gonna flush some of that adrenaline out. 
So when you go into your presentation, your interview, you're going to go in there in a little less of an aroused state. You're going to be a little bit more relaxed. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I gave my first keynote presentation, it was in front of about 300 people. I was so nervous. Uh, one of the strategies that I used, that I still use to this day, is I found a separate room in the, in the conference center in Baltimore, and I would kind of like just gently jog back and forth. Not enough to cause a sweat, but just to kind of get my heart rate up. There's been other conferences where I've just kind of done some steps outside or gone up and down, because what that does is it relaxes the body. And so that's a very powerful tool that I would challenge you all to consider doing before giving a presentation. It may seem a little bit different because I think a lot of what a lot of communications coaches will tell you is focus on breathing. It's a powerful tool. It works for some people. There's one called box breathing where you breathe in for four seconds and then you breathe out for four seconds for as long as you need to in order to relax. And what that does is it engages what's called your parasympathetic nervous system and you use that to calm yourself, yoga, meditation, so on. Doesn't work for everybody. Doesn't work for me as, as well as movement prior to the event. That's the first strategy that I would suggest to you to relax your body. The second strategy that I would recommend to you is what's called deliberate practice. And it's not regular practice. And what deliberate practice is going to help you do is it's also going to help you become a powerful communicator, whether it's online or face to face, because it's going to be a tool that you can use to get constant practice. One of the the complaints, I wouldn't say it's a complaint, but one of the challenges that a lot of Toastmasters have is that they may not get to speak at every meeting. Uh, they may not feel confident to, so they don't have a lot of practice. And the only time they practice is the time they get called for table topics or the time that they have some, they, they've secured a time to practice their speech. So they don't get enough practice, they're not going to necessarily be confident. Deliberate practice and a strategy I'll share you, with you right after it will help you get both practice and calm your nerves. Now, I used to work at a baseball academy in the Dominican Republic. And one of the things that we had was essentially a batting cage. And in the batting cage, on one side of the batting cage, you'd have a pitcher who threw the ball. And on the other end of the batting cage, you have a batter who would swing and try to hit the ball. Very straightforward. And now there's a, there's a difference between practice and deliberate practice. And I'll illustrate the two. Regular practice is if that pitcher throws the ball, the batter swings, he hits or he misses, it doesn't really matter, and then he goes again, and he goes again, and he goes again. So that's just like a two-step loop. Pitcher throws, he hits or misses. Pitcher throws, he hits or misses. That's regular practices, and that's how most people practice. With regular practice, you can only progress to a maximum level, and at some point, you're not going to progress any further. Deliberate practice as one more component on, into the practice protocol. Same scenario, the ball gets pitched, the batter swings. He hits it or he misses it. But deliberate practice adds one more step. At that moment, whether he hits or misses it, he, takes it, he thinks, all right, I hit it. What can I do next time to make sure I hit it again? Or if he missed it, he goes, what can I do, or he or she goes, what can I do next time to make sure I hit it. He does that, and then the ball gets pitched again, and that cycle keeps going over and over again. Ball gets pitched, he's, the batter swings, hits or misses, and then takes one more moment to review what can I do better next time, or what can I do to avoid what I did wrong the previous time. And that's what deliberate practice is, and that's what progresses you faster and faster and faster. And so what all of you can do as Toastmasters to not only get more comfortable and become much more powerful presenters face-to-face -face or online is to use your smartphone or your iPhone and record yourself either practicing your speech or I would challenge you to start creating 90 seconds to two minute videos for social media or for YouTube. Record them on your camera, watch yourself do it, and then record it again and again and again and again. And maybe it takes 10, 15, 20 tries to get that right one. But by the 10th or 20th try of that same video, you're going to have learned unconsciously how to cut out information that's unnecessary. You're going to get more and more comfortable doing it over and over and over again. And you're getting so much more practice. Secondly, as you keep reviewing yourself in your screen, 
you're going to start getting used to seeing yourself on screen in the same format that you come across in Zoom. So I would challenge you to do this not only to get better on Zoom, but also to get better in face-to-face -face presentations when you do end up giving speeches uh, in front of groups as well or presentations. The only difference is you'll probably, if you're preparing for a real life situation, you're going to record your entire body versus probably just this part of your body. So that's what I would challenge you to do to get deliberate practice. So inoculate before you, you speak. Second is deliberate practice. One more thing that I would add to this, and this is the most powerful for me, uh, you can use it in face-to-face -face presentations or speeches or just any type of engagement and online. And what it is is arriving early and greeting the people. Because one of the biggest causes for nervousness and anxiety, and it makes total sense, is that you're speaking in front of people you've never met before. It's strange and it's so awkward, right? So if it is a face-to-face -face presentation, get there early, fist bump, shake hands, meet people, introduce yourself. Then when you give your presentation, you're gonna conduct your meeting, you're gonna already have created a bond, you're going to be able to have some sort of a connection, so it's gonna feel less awkward. On a Zoom call, oftentimes the speaker comes in right at the time that the presentation starts. No, get there 15, 20 minutes early. The rules still apply. Get there early, connect with people, talk with people, and then it's gonna be much more comfortable because you're gonna be talking with people who, have, who, have, who you kind of already know. So that's very, a very powerful way to relieve a lot of the anxiety. I will tell you one more tool. This was kind of a nugget wisdom that I learned in order to get good at, get comfortable at speaking in front of others. And it was to use networking events as a way to train myself to reduce a lot of my anxiety. Because if you have anxiety going up and meeting somebody for the first time at a networking event, good luck speaking in front of a larger group of people that you've never met before, even if it's 10 or 20. Because if you, if you can't speak to one person, it's going to be very challenging to others. So what you do is you start looking at networking opportunities as opportunities to practice initiating. If you go up to someone, you start a conversation, that act of starting the conversation, going against your nature of trying to avoid it or waiting for someone to come up and connect with you, that's going to make you a little bit stronger, a little bit more bolder, a little bit more confident. So that carries over to when you give presentations uh, on Zoom or, or face to face. It's, it's very, very powerful. And it goes back to what I told you about what I believe at the beginning of this presentation. What you're doing is you're training in all situations to be able to use these skills in every situation. Another example, this is a bit of a tangent, but if you are standing in line at the grocery store, I would challenge you to stand like this. If you're at a bar or a club, stand like this. This is the most comfortable, this is the most powerful position to start a presentation from when you're face to face with somebody. However, if you're not practicing it in your day to day life, then on the day that you have to give a presentation, good luck. Your brain is going to be focusing on not messing up, getting the presentation right. You're not going to be thinking about keeping your hands by your side. So the idea is use the opportunities outside of your actual presentation to get comfortable and make it your, your default. Essentially, you're training yourself to have a default. So this is a good segue into the next section, which is powerful presence, which in essence is uh, how to, to come across powerfully <laughs> without actually saying a word. Uh, we're gonna just touch on the visual side because I wanna make sure that we cover this today. We'll skip on the sound side because that's all the, don't say um, yeah, you know, all the stuff you learn in, in Toastmasters and many of you are perfectly aware, probably lost a little bit of money in some sort of tip jar <laughs> for saying these things. Appearance, as I mentioned before, it's so powerful. Uh, the clothing is, is one aspect of it. The other thing is you wanna take up Scream, right? And if you have a light on your face, your facial features are gonna come out, your hair is gonna come out, everything's gonna come out. So it's so important to just really, in advance to your, your Zoom meeting or your online meeting, log on without accessing the meeting and then see how you look. Make sure you have good body position in the screen. Now, there was, a, there was actually a group in Brazil, and I think I've told some of you here about this. They had another role in their Toastmasters meeting, which was pretty cool. They had the, essentially the hidden visual assessment role. It's kind of like a secret shopper. You don't know they exist. 
they're in the back hidden and they are looking at every single member of your Toastmasters group who's on that Zoom call and giving feed and, and making observations on how they look on screen. Some people have too much junk behind them. And when they have too much junk behind them, everybody else is looking at that junk and going, boy, that person's pretty slovenly. So maybe next time they'll make a recommendation that they have a clear background. Or maybe for them, a Zoom screen is necessary because they can't get rid of that stuff behind them. But that's the role. Appearance is so key. The second thing is, is body language and movement. I don't know if you've been on a lot of Zoom calls. Well, you probably have. All of us have been on a lot of Zoom calls. And this is what you see. Basically this. Nothing, no facial expression. And because they're sitting so close to the screen, the shoulder is cut off, you can't see the hands really moving, right? So I would challenge you, even if you're sitting, to move a little bit further back from the screen and try to incorporate your hands a little bit more and really think about using your facial expression, uh, your, your body to help get that message across. Because you as a communicator have one primary role and that's to use whatever tools at your disposal that is necessary to get your message across. And it, I'm not saying sound smart. I'm not saying give the most powerful, beautiful presentation. I'm just, or PowerPoint presentation. I'm just using everything at your disposal to get your message across so that the listener understands. There was, um, this is related to body language, but it's also related to um, nonverbals. I was in China and uh, we were manufacturing our product and, and packaging it to ship. And we made the mistake of not having an interpreter who was vetted. <laughs> they weren't vetted very well. So their English was pretty atrocious. Granted, our, our Chinese was very bad. And so we couldn't communicate using words, but we still had to communicate effectively. And that's where you truly learn the importance of starting to use your body language, because a lot of the movements are very universal to get your message across. A lot of Toastmasters are ESL, English as a second language. You know, a lot of you who are in the technical fields, in the sciences, a lot of your colleagues are gonna be ESL. And so just using big words and saying a lot of stuff, uh, just using your words is not gonna be effective. Start using your body because a lot of the messages are, um, are universal. A lot of the body languages are universal. Granted, uh, I'll give you an example of one that's universal but doesn't mean the same thing. <laughs> Uh, here in North America, this means good. In Brazil, never do this. This is really bad. <laughs> this, is a, this is kind of like an insult to somebody, but that's an example of how body language can, can backfire. But generally speaking, use body language to get your message across. The next is posture, right? When you hear the words executive presence, what comes to mind is someone who has very strong bearing, whether it's a male or a female. They come across powerfully, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, they take up screen, they look confident, and without saying anything, they can get their presence across. But posture isn't something that you're guaranteed in life. In fact, we spend our entire life destroying our posture. If you think about someone sitting at a desk all day like this, typing away, their posture is bad, and this becomes their default position. That's why you see a lot of people walking around like this all the time. And when it comes to presenting, as I mentioned before, if your mind is thinking about the presentation, you're not going to be thinking about your posture. You're going to be presenting from a bad place of a, a bad postural position. And that's why when you're sitting at your desk, I would challenge you to sit up straight all the time, whenever you're working as best you can, or at least think about it or get up from your desk and go for a walk. When you're outside, you're making sure to keep your shoulders back and your chest up. If you're exercising, strengthen the back of your body. And this is not about vanity. This is about improving your posture so you never have to think about it. So you always have good posture so that when you get up on stage, you have good presence. And that's the idea of, of why posture is so important. The other thing is if you stand by default, you're gonna have better posture because your body is just gonna be taller. So I would challenge you to stand when you present. The next thing is about energy. Energy is also a lifestyle related uh, function, so to speak. When you present on Zoom, many of you have probably been in a presentation or, or a meeting where someone just seems really lethargic. They're sitting there just kind of talking and it's just putting you to sleep because they're not projecting, they're not bringing any energy. And they may be tired, right? They have a lot of things that they're worrying about, family, COVID, money, whatever it might be. 
But if you're thinking as a Toastmaster, as someone who really wants to get your message across, the day before your presentation, I would challenge you to get a good night's sleep, not eat a lot of food in the morning. In fact, I wouldn't eat anything other than some, uh, some highly refined carbohydrates, just a small amount right before your presentation. Have plenty of water, move your body. So that way, your body's gonna be much more alert, much more energetic, and you can really move forward towards the audience and project. That's just, that's just a very powerful tool to use it. Another way that you can, you can project, again, project energy is to stand. Because when you're standing, you're not encumbered by your chair. And just the fact that you're moving, your body's much more comfortable doing that, you're going to feel much more energetic and your message is going to get across. Right? I'm going to give a little bit of a tangent on energy. Because your audience, two things happen when you begin to speak to them energy-wise not to you, to the audience. Number one, they're physically getting tired from sitting there listening to you for the entire time. They are, their body's just getting tired. That's why a lot of people go, oh, my back, or after a long Zoom call, you're just exhausted. Physically, they're getting tired. And that's why you gotta get them to ideally change their position, move. The second thing is they're getting mentally tired. I want you to think about the fact that the moment you start to speak, the audience's brain, starts running, it starts to exercise. And the more you talk, the longer you talk, the more complicated what you're saying is, the quicker their brain gets tired and fatigued. That's why short, concise is very important, or keep it shorter, simpler, keep it very short. The other, but with regards to energy, if they're, you know they're getting tired, really just kind of give them the energy. You have to bring it. And sometimes you may be exhausted at the end for being the presenter, but really think, if you bring the energy, the audience is much more likely to be receptive to what you're going to say. Uh, facial expressions, very straightforward. Use this because that's all that we have to see. And when you use them, make sure they match your emotions. Today, we're excited to let you know that you're getting fired today. That doesn't match, right? Uh, I'm excited to tell you, I, I'm sorry, I'm telling you that your sister passed away this morning. It doesn't match. You have to really practice getting your emotions, your facial expressions to match your, your words. But more importantly, it's very, very important that you use your facial expressions. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a tangent again with regards to Toastmasters. And this is why oftentimes it's best not to look at your whole audience uh, while you're speaking or giving a presentation because they forget they're part of the presentation. And so you're speaking, you're giving all this and this is what you get in return. Right? They may be excited, they may be happy, but they forget because they, they can't see you Generally, their face is kind of, it's not angry, it's just no emotion, right? No emotion is emotion, and it affects the listeners. So if you're a participant in a Toastmasters meeting, I would challenge you to just to, you know, nod your head and smile from time to time for the, uh, for the speaker. I'm not saying right now, I'm just telling just in general. <laughs> and then lastly, the eye contact is key. You make eye contact by looking in the lens, you'll really connect well with the audience. I think for time's sake, I'm going to cut it right there uh, on another opportunity. I will share with you the message map. I'll just, this is the message map as a seven stage process to which you can craft a presentation. I put it here as a teaser. So perhaps you want me back again another time. There are seven things that you've probably heard of before, but this is a structure that really kind of becomes a good framework for whenever you're giving a presentation, creating a social media program or a pitch. Another thing that I will share with you in another time is an enhancement checklist. Once you create your message map, then you have to go over it like you're adding more ingredients to a, a fine meal and ask, is it novel? Are the number, numbers friendly? Is it understandable? Are there verbal pictures? Is it interactive? You go by that. So there's a systematic approach to creating presentations. And thank you. We'll just leave it at that. If any of you are ever interested in having some coaching or some training for your organization, please contact me. Thank you. Q&A. Thank you so much, John. Please, everybody type in your question in the chat. And can you tell, while we're waiting, can you tell John what I'm doing right now? <laughs> I'm trying to incorporate one of your suggestions. After <laughs> hearing your <laughs> presentation, I feel so pressured and nervous, so I'm trying to get it out. <laughs> oh, good, good. We already have, um, John, one question from Elaine regarding some equipments uh, with uh, virtual communication. But Elaine, may I ask you to uh, 
unmute yourself and ask a question to John, please. Sure, Zumi. How you doing, John? Hey, um, thank you for sharing your setup because we're all working on that, especially Toastmasters. So true what you said about people in the witness protection program and thinking that that's a cool way to appear on screen at Toastmasters is crazy, right? Could you please address audio since you're doing keynotes virtually? Um, tell us a little bit about a good mic, if you would, a good headset mic combination you recommend. Anything you'd like to recommend on that, I'm all ears. Thank you. Sure. Uh, what I would recommend is having a, uh, what's it called? Well, I'll show you because I forget the name of it. <laughs> it's, it's a mic that's meant to record sound in distances. In distances. It's called a, sh oh, it's called a shotgun mic. Uh, and Audio Technica is a good one, but you don't have to spend a lot of money to get it. Uh, my ring light, this, uh, what's it called? <laughs> this mic, they, they came together with a stand for about $140 from Best Buy. It doesn't need to be that great. Uh, it, it just helps versus having the, the microphone within the, the computer. Uh, that's what I would suggest. I'm not a huge fan of having the headset uh, because it, it just loses a little bit of its professionalism, I feel. But that, again, this is just my opinion. Thank you. Moving on. Right, to any ideas with earbuds, by the way? I'm sorry, Izumi. Uh, no, I got earbuds because there's no. Uh... I, I either use the, 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 the sound from the laptop or the sound from a speaker that's connected. I don't, I don't use earbuds. I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you then, a specific type of earbud. Thank you. We have two questions regarding the camera and the looking at the audience, but let's start with Satish's question. Satish, please unmute yourself. Good afternoon. Hey, Izumi, good afternoon. Thanks, thanks for giving me this opportunity. John, amazing presentation and a lot of things that you said uh, resonated really well. My question is, when you look at the camera, I always want to look at the camera, but I'm also tempted to look at the audience reaction because this is something we are tuned to, I would say, as Toastmasters, to look at how the audience is reacting so you can tweak accordingly. What would you say? How do you, how do, you do that? I mean, in your setup, I, I briefly le looked at your setup, and uh, you seem to have just that camera, but you, are you also looking at the audience? Well, uh, let's, let's be very candid here. What I showed you is one, one way of having the camera. There's another way of having the camera. Mm -hmm. which is here. So there's the monitor, which is basically wow. the laptop. And all I've done is I've put the lens, a, a webcam directly in front of the path of the monitor. The monitor is here, the webcam is here. So then I can look directly at the webcam. I was doing the exact same thing with my laptop, but I find this is a way that I can use my peripheral vision. I've always imagined, if any of you are engineers uh, working on laptops, I would challenge you to put the lens of the camera in the middle of the screen. <laughs> that way, then everyone, no one has to kind of worry about it. That becomes a powerful way. I would say for Toastmasters meetings, yeah, look at the audience for reactions they're trained to. I shouldn't say, I'm not saying everyone's a dog, no one's trained. <laughs> they practice and rehearse that. But a traditional audience, whether it's a business meeting, generally they're not going to give you much uh, facial response. A lot of them are going to be off. I think it's going to be more distracting than not. If you're going to make it a lot more interactive, then yeah, you have to do it. It just, you're going to have to gauge it on the number. If it's like 10 or 12 people generally, yeah, it's manageable, but 50 or 60, the screens are going to be popping out of everywhere. It's just better to focus on your message and then have an interactive, less formal component to it. That's what I would say. So, so, so John, I've tried that where you put the camera right in front, maybe with a stand, you, you put the camera up and then, you know, your monitor is behind it. The problem is it's peripheral vision because if you're looking at the camera, you're really not looking at the people. All you're seeing is in the peripheral vision. You know what I'm saying? Well, uh, I'm not so sure how to tackle that. So. Well, there's two things, Satish. First one is when you're speaking, you have a message to get across. Look at the camera, use your peripheral and look at, you'll see some sort of facial reaction, some sort of movement. But if you're speaking with somebody in specific, that's when you look at the individual box and the monitor in the, in the individual. 
uh, in the individual screens. I would also challenge you, if you're able to get an even bigger screen behind you, right, like almost like a wall, then you're always going to be looking like you're connecting with them, even though you're not looking at them, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, great point. Yeah, absolutely. Now I know I can ask my wife, you know, we need to get that big, big monitor. So right, there we go. Exactly. It, it's professional, business expense. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much, John. You're welcome. To get the maximum numbers of questions in, I will read that question to you, John. Um, a question from Andy. How can you make sure you're looking good on camera while you are seeing the gallery view so you can assess the audience reaction? Would you say the same method apply that you just explained? Well, I, I, would, I would just be a little relaxed on the looking good. It's not a vanity thing. It's set up so that you look good on professional when you first log on. That means log on to Zoom before you get onto your Zoom meeting, have your own Zoom meeting or uh, Cybex meeting, whatever it is. Check how you look. That's kind of it. I wouldn't really worry about it beyond that because you're already set good on camera. And then when you log in, yeah, just address the audience from time to time. Check that you haven't just, if you're standing, gone off screen. But over time, you'll, you'll become very comfortable with just taking up, using the space that you have uh, in that frame. Thank you, John. Another way you can do it is just to make sure you don't use the gallery view. If you do, uh, sorry, yeah, if you don't do the gallery view, if you do speaker view, you only see yourself. Uh, I don't know how many people just love staring at themselves the entire time, so you're more likely to look at the lens of your camera, okay? That's a powerful way to do it. Thank you. Next question is from Jay. Is a green screen needed to avoid wonky images when a virtual background is used, even on most recent Macs? I would say that a green screen is, helps with Zoom. If you're using a Zoom, if you're doing a Zoom meeting and you decide that you want to have, if you have really good lighting for your, your Zoom back, your green screen, uh, you want to come across really professional, then use it. I don't think you necessarily need it, but I will tell you that if you are going to try to create social media content, I would challenge you to get a green screen. Here's mine over here. That's just a green screen that I've, uh, what's it called? Uh, painter's tape to the wall, because <laughs> I want to take it off at some point. But you can get freestanding stands in that. And that becomes just a very powerful tool for uh, when you create social media content. The key is the lighting. Have a lavalier mic uh, that connects from your phone all the way to you. That way you don't, it doesn't sound bad. That would be how I would suggest it. Thank you, John. And Andy I had another question. What can you do if the only room you have has an echo? Well, then you have to get a, a uh, essentially you know, like a covering for your, your mic head. get rid of that um, that's the best thing another thing is something that's pretty low budget uh, <laughs> but if you can find a way to speak in your closet where there's a lot of clothing the clothing will help muffle some of that sound uh, help get rid of that echo so first things first is if you can get a mic that helps get rid of the echo great second is speak in a room that has some sort of buffer and clothing is one of those tools to use as a buffer mm -hmm. Thank you. So maybe a comment to the situation by Kiran. She, has, uh, she was in this difficult situation. When I was standing, I was moving a bit. Most of the audience were watching in gallery view and they suggested to sit and talk instead. Like then what can Kiran do in such situation? <laughs> that's, a tough, that's a tough question. I, I've never experienced that before. Uh, I would always say that well, it depends what you're present, what you're doing, right? If you're if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation and 90% of your message is PowerPoint, it really doesn't matter too much if you stand. But if you are the center point of your message, then I would challenge you to stand. It, it depends on the context and the audience, right? Great, thank you. One last question: Can you show the lighting you were using? The, the what what is the lighting that you suggested? The white ring? Yes, I will show you. Is it? Uh. Is it cold? <laughs> is it cold? What is it called? Uh, it, it's just called a ring light. You can get it at, mm -hmm. that one's just at Best Buy. 
You can go on Amazon, just type in ring light, all sorts. They can be as low as $20. You can spend $700. You don't have to use it. You could just use two lights. When I first started, I just used this. This was, this came with my green light, green screen. Like you don't need a lot of money to do all this kind of stuff. Someone asked me if I was in a studio. They said, oh, you're in a studio. You look different. No, you just saw it. I said, white wall. <laughs> That's it. You know, all of you can come across much more effectively as you'd like uh, just by making a few changes. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for the great session today. Before I hand it over to the closing remarks by Gavin, let me summarize again, everybody. John shared his best practice, uh, three points. One was how to be impactful. Um, the tips, impactful tips on virtual communication. And second was dealing with anxiety and nervousness. And the third point, how to obtain a powerful executive presence. And we missed um, some more great points such as messaging, but uh, messaging map about and John, if you can share the last slide, um, if, if people want to know more about it, please, you can reach out to John's uh, contact. Uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to Gavin for the closing remarks. Over to you, Gavin. Thank you, Izumi, our Toastmaster. And please help me give a huge round of applause to our presenter today, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaker for the second session is Elaine. Please help me welcome Elaine Long. Hi, everybody. Elaine, yeah. Thank you, Gavin. Hi, John. Thank you so much. Big round of applause for John again. Fabulous job today. We all have to up level our game now, toasters. District 101 and beyond. And uh, I'm speaking next week on the third, and I'm so pleased to see what John's introduced. Did he give good content? Did he give, yeah? Raise your hand. Did he give actionable steps that you can take today, if you want to, to go yes. out and make the way you appear on screen better? Yes. Yes, exactly. So my challenge is take his challenges, go do that. I'm going to do the same thing. You see what I got? I'm just like you. I'm coming up through the Toastmaster ranks and working on building my coaching business. Just like John. So next week, we're going to dovetail off some of what he talked about, especially the improv stuff, the improv skills applied to speakers like you and me, how we can be more present and in the moment, how we can really connect with our audience online, how can you tell a story that motivates your audience to action? We're going to dive deep into that. We're going to be interactive. Everybody who's hiding behind your screen shut off. Not next week, everybody. I want you to get online and push yourself and be ready. Have the light on your face. Have a clean background. Come ready to play full out. We're going to have a good time. Back to you, Gavin. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Please help me give yourself a bigger round of applause because this is a new journey. Division D, all the members, especially the six area directors, we work together to create a new program, the program, the Toastmaster Revelation program. We are here to fill up the missing parts of Toastmasters to just deliver with the presentation based on the real world and then starting from there, we go, we dive now. deeper and deeper. Right. And thank you all for coming. Thank you again for John. Thank you for the great opening uh, of our program chair, Ishiras. Uh, I just announced the, this session is officially adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Hello, Mr. Hicks. Yeah, you can stay here a little longer if you want to communicate or ask any questions relating to this program, the coming sessions or the plan or the team, any aspects, because our goal is to fill up the missing part of a Toastmaster program. Everything is on the real world. It's not something like 
from the books, from the pathways, but you can see the quality, right? From John's presentation today. So any questions relating to the program? Yeah, I wonder if John will come back next week if you're free from two to three Pacific and give us the secret shopper, you know, treatment. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone here will know that there's a secret shopper now. <laughs> we'll keep it. We'll, we promise we won't tell. Uh, okay. I may or I may not, but I may. Okay, thank you. Thank That's you. a great idea. Uh, Thanks for job, sharing. I want you back again this thank year. You. Not oh. just in the future, but this year. I want you back again. Well, thank you for having me. This is, you know, everyone's on the same, same journey and it's just, it's ultimately it's freedom, right? To be able to articulate yourself and it's just empowering at the end of the day. So. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.